I saw a poll this week that 80% of the people in this country have a family member or a friend who has died or been injured. And of each of those people, they each know seven people who have died or been injured. This is truly incomprehensible trauma for many around the world to even comprehend, Mr. President. How do you help people? Because they, they tell us, they look to you, that you represent for them these values of freedom and democracy that they're fighting for. How do you help them bear this terrible burden of loss? We don't have 100% efficient medicine in this situation. And when we are looking for a medicine or support for people in order to somehow find a substitution for their loss, I think this is all just a lie. Because when you lost your near and dear, what could substitute your loss? Warm words, money, some support, maybe a psychological one? All of this still cannot patch up that hole in the middle of a person. Nobody will substitute the love that Putin and his army took away. So you can just be near them and with those people. Fight. And definitely do not forgive those who took all of this away. Despite the fact that we don't have a coordinated plan on the tribunal in the world, but you yourself have to know that those people need justice. If we won't find justice for all these murderers later on, justice for Ukraine through the sentences for all these murderers, this space inside people will be filled with hatred and revenge. Yeah. Is there, is there ever forgiveness for the Ukrainians who were in occupied territory, who may have collaborated or may have gone along with uh, the Russians and maybe they'll say they felt they had no choice. But to unite Ukraine, will there be forgiveness? The most difficult situation will be happening in the society because you need time for everything. Sometimes time heals. And as I mentioned, the justice heals too. I'm convinced, but the sentences should be happening. People should know if you were a murderer and was fighting against Ukraine, you will be sentenced. Even if you were made by force to kill Ukrainians, you will be answering for your deeds. Nobody will forgive you, and you won't be able to explain all of this. However, those who were under occupation and were not fighting on the side of the enemy, they are Ukrainians. In any case, time will answer those questions, and so will our law enforcement agencies. We have our interior minister, which is working now on the security platform for the temporary occupied territories. There will be answers to this question, too. You know, you live every day knowing in a very tangible way, you and many other Ukrainians, that you may die in a very tangible way. In the first few weeks of the war, Ukrainian intelligence said that you had survived a dozen assassination attempts and, and who knows since then, right? It, it, it's not something to even track. But how does knowing that you are, as many say, one of the top targets in this world for, for death, how does that impact how you live, Mr. President? I'll be honest with you and tell you I've decided if I will be thinking about it constantly, I will just shut myself down. Very much like Putin now, who doesn't leave his bunker. If I will isolate myself, I won't understand what's going on around me in the country. I will lose the connection with society. And if I lose this connection, I would lose the society. I'm convinced that society has to see if they are at risk, their president is at risk too, together with them. Of course, they understand that I have protection, etc., but I have to be on the same side with my people. You know you can get yourself into a cage like an animal and chain yourself there constantly, thinking that you are just about to get killed. Of course, my bodyguards should think of how to prevent this from happening. And this is their task. I don't think about it. Clearly, those sabotage groups might be back again and try to get rid of me. In all wars, they wanted to get rid of leaders of thoughts. 
leaders of countries, all sorts of motivators. So I leave this to the professionals, and I will free my mind to resolve the strategic issues. I met with an infantry soldier named Vlad the other day. Uh, he was a history teacher before the war. He's fighting now on the front line near Zaporizhia. And he has not seen his wife or his children in a year. But he said it's okay. He's waiting for victory. He was, he was, he was fine to wait, but it's been a year. And when you talk about needing Biden to say something now, I wonder, Mr. President, how long can your troops keep fighting like they are now? It depends on some things which we both understand. It depends on support with weapons from our partners. Depends on financial support. But any kind of support with energy supplies. Sanctions, yet it all depends on the moral obligations and political decisions and political will of our partners. The Ukrainian motivation will not diminish. Yeah. What can we lose? We can lose everything. What can we gain? We can gain victory. What is our victory? It means returning everything of our own. That's why we don't have it any other way. How can we lose our motivation when willing to survive? We defend our common values, democracy and freedom. But in our case, freedom and democracy are not just words. In our case, this is our life. We are in Odessa now, and if we won't defend our coastline, the Russians will be here tomorrow, and we won't have our sea. If we won't have our sea, we won't have any logistical way to sell and grow our crops. So we will be losing our country. So we are fighting in order not to be a desert. I know when I talk about Vlad not seeing his children, I know that you, you aren't, as, as president, you're not able to live with your own children, like so many of your soldiers on the front lines. Mr. President, when people see you, they see maybe a loneliness, a loneliness that so many here feel. You feel, too, that, that you are also suffering. How do you manage that? pain. With some pain. Yet, it's not a pain which was in the first days of the invasion. I experienced pain when I saw with my own eyes the consequences of occupation in Bucha and other places. It was a pain as I was just trying to understand what we should do to prevent all this. It's not a real and we cannot rewind things. We cannot retake this or that frame. This is not a film. This is a reality. That was my pain for all the losses we had. But today, it's not a pain. It's a big obligation and respect for those who are no longer with us. This is an obligation to stand here until the end and rebuild what people were dying for. Rebuild a peaceful life in Ukraine. If we give what is most valuable for us, our life and our time with children, which you just mentioned, okay, maybe another half a year or a year, let's think it will happen sooner. And after that, our life will go on. The life of our children will go on. If we give up now, we'll have a complete exile as we will lose everything for sure and our children will go elsewhere. Those who can will escape, and those who can't will just die here. That's why we have to stay and fight. The world should understand that we are fighting for our common values because Putin won't stop here. He will go further. It wasn't just rumors when I was saying that he will go to Poland and the Baltic states. You will see, he will go further. When he was transferring the Wagnerites to Belarus and frightening the Poles and the Lithuanians, at first he is intimidating them, but give him an opportunity to grow his force, lose Ukraine, and he will go further. And NATO will decide then what to do.